The operational phase of the African Continental Free Trade Area has been launched. Heads of state and government assembled in Niger's capital Niamey this month, holding a day-long summit that saw the kick-starting of guiding instruments of the CFTA. The agreement, ratified by more than half of Africa's countries and regions, now forms the world's largest free trade area since the formation of the World Trade Organization. The formation of Africa's new trade bloc comes amidst a rising tide of global unilateralism, even as the continent gears up to boost intra-Africa commerce, development and integration. So is the CFTA the answer to transforming Africa's trade with itself and the world? And what challenges lie ahead for the continental trade bloc? I'm Beatrice Marshall. Welcome to Talk Africa. As Africa's leaders deliberated on enacting the CFTA at the July summit in Niamey, the president of the African Development Bank, Akinwumi Adesina, spoke to CGTN on the sidelines about the promise and the road ahead for the CFTA. Let's take a listen. What it means is that Africa itself wants to create wealth within its own zone. You know, instead of depending on others for your wealth, why not just take advantage of your population, your own demand, and create investments, in, you know, intra-Africa investments. So this is what it's all about. This is going to open up a market of literally $3.3 trillion. Just think about it. And so it's going to create a lot of jobs. It's going to lead to a massive amount of investments. It's going to make Africa also more competitive when it comes to particular industries in which it has natural competitive advantage. So whether it's regional value chains, whether it's global value chains, you're going to find out that Africa becomes um, a very um, uh, exciting area for investors to come in. So a number of things uh, obviously still has to be done. Uh, first and foremost is we have to continue to work to close Africa's massive infrastructure gap. Y you know, you can only trade uh, if you are able to get from one place to the other. Right, and get the goods from point A to point B. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. You know, and so Africa still has a, a massive deficit of about you know, 68 to $108 billion in terms of infrastructure financing gap per year. But a lot is being done. We are working a lot in making sure that um, we can connect the landlocked countries, of which we have uh, roughly about 18 of those out of the 54 countries are landlocked countries investing in ports, investing in rail, investing in airports, uh, investing in ICT infrastructure to allow connectivity and also to be able to do outsourcing of, uh, uh, of services. So these are areas that are continuing to be um, areas that we have been investing in as African Development Bank. Agriculture. The bulk of our economies are still predominantly agricultural. Yes. Biggest employer, biggest component of GDP and so on and so forth. But we also see a fairly significant amount of protectionism um, on that front among specific economies. If the CFT is to work, those protectionist standards have to go down. But is, do you see a future where regions, at least, can have common sanitary and phytosanitary standards, um, at the very least, as a starting point towards essentially making sure that, say, uh, milk powder from Kenya can get all the way to Nigeria in a very seamless manner? Well, absolutely. You know, trade is all about standardization. You know, if you send me a product and you're sending another person a product, those products have to be the same. So I think being able to have quality assurance and standards and harmonization is the key uh, to, being able to, do, uh, uh, to being able to do trade. If you take the case of agriculture uh, that you mentioned, yes, obviously everybody protects their agricultural sector. Well, Europeans do it, uh, the Americans do it, China's, China does it, Japan does it. Everybody protects their agricultural sector. So there is no uh, doubt in my mind that the sector will need to continue to have a lot of uh, uh, support from governments to support smallholder farmers, to have access to technologies, to have access to finance, to be able to connect to a market. Those are things that you have to do. But beyond that, I don't think that Africa will go far uh, by just simply you know, saying, well, you know, we're going to just block ourselves from trade with the rest of the world. No. What we've got to do is to make sure we increase productivity, to make sure we're fixing our infrastructure deficits that make us not as competitive as we could be, to make sure that we can have just what you said about grades and standards and you know, commodities and, uh, can move from place to place, knowing fully well that is a standard thing that's uh, actually there. So that's where the bank, the African Development Bank, uh, we've been supporting quite a lot of work 
in making sure that we can harmonize standards because the standards are going to be very, very important, not just for agriculture, for, for anything that's actually been done. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Let's get a broader perspective now of the CFTA. From Addis Ababa, I'm joined by Ambassador Kwati Thomas Kwesi. He's the Deputy Chairperson of the African Union Commission. In studio with me, Dr. Francis Mongeni. He's the Director of Trade and Customs Division at the Common Market for Eastern and Southern Africa Commerce. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us on the program. I want to start off with the latest developments on the CFTA and how historic this has been uh, following the ratification on the agreement establishing the CFTA. Uh, it has now launched the operational phase of the continental market. Dr. Mangeni, how historic a move is this for Africa at this point? This is very historic indeed. It was uh, thought unthinkable, but it has happened. And this is bound to go down in the annals of history, together with the, uh, the formation of the Organization for African Unity on the 25th of May 1963 in Addis, which launched the decolonization struggles which we waged and finally concluded in 1994. It's also going to go down in the annals of history, together with the, the formation of the African Union, which started in the year 2000 and was launched in the year 2002. And now we have the continental free trade area, which is the solid step that we have taken towards continental integration. So it is historic indeed. Right. Ambassador Kwesi, what will be the African Union's role here? Because when you look at uh, uh, Africa's uh, over 50 countries, they are all at varied levels of development uh, with vari ec varied mm -hmm. economic potential. What will be the role of the African Union in fostering the success of the CFTA? No, actually, the African Union is in the process of making arrangements such that even though there'll be losers and there'll be winners, we're seeking some measures of averaging the benefits. Because we are at very different levels of development, but you know, before you can trade, you have to produce. So we have to put our production on a modern scientific level. And this by itself opens up the economic space. It provides the institutional environment, which will encourage more foreign investment and uh, safer investment for those wishing to invest in Africa. But we need to develop this ourselves. And as the arrangement progresses, the best evidence of its valuability, of its value, will be seen in the way the economies of Africa are beginning to integrate together. If we start to do that with the institutional arrangements that we have, the economy of Africa will begin to move up. Understand that any time there's uh, an increase in trafficking trade by a factor of, say, 2%, GDP levels rise by about a factor of 10%. So the potential is great, but we have to now put our production on a scientific basis because we are moving into the knowledge economy. That also means that we have to increase the educational level of our people, our farmers our boys and girls. We, we, we need to move towards a literate and enumerate Africa because we are moving to a knowledge economy. But we begin to see Africa as one entity, which is what it was before the Berlin Conference. So we are steadily and slowly unraveling the knots in which we were tied up in Berlin. So this is a truly historic development. Dr. Mungiti, let's look at what's going to happen now. Talk us through the next steps, though, now that the CFTA has been operationalized. What are we going to see in the interim, in the short term, in the long term? Right. So now the CFTA was launched on the 7th of July uh, this year in Niamey by the heads of state and government. And a period of one year has been put in place for finalizing all the outstanding work so that come 1st July next year, trading begins under the continental free trade area framework. So what are the next steps? First of all, we need to make sure that the instruments which have been put in place to support the operation of the continental free trade area are in operation. They are actually functioning. We, these instruments include the system for addressing non-tariff barriers so that people can report any restrictions or delays or costly measures being put in place which can affect our trade. We need a digital payment system which is efficient and 
people can use for making payments. Because if you trade but you can't uh, make payments or receive payments, yeah. uh, then that wouldn't be useful at all. The Africa Trade Observatory needs to be in place in order to disseminate information to economic operators about opportunities for trade and investment under the continent of free trade area. So these operational instruments need to be put in place. Then secondly, the preparatory work that needs to be done by the governments to produce the necessary documents for trading needs to be done and completed for a consignment to move across borders. For trade to actually happen across borders, you need certain documents. Normally in trade mm -hmm. within ourselves, we often mm -hmm. trade in third party currency. Right. So with Africa's over 54, 50 countries mm -hmm. and uh, different uh, currencies at play, how is it going to work in terms of uh, trading? Right, so this is a very critical issue. And uh, fortunately, our heads of state and government, our leaders and our private sector have actually given some thought, some very serious thought to it. So when the operational phase of the continental free trade area was launched in Iame on 7th of July, one of the instruments, the five instruments that were launched, was the digital payment system, which needs to be operationalized under the auspices of the uh, Afri Afriexim Bank, together with the African Association of Bankers, who are actually the stakeholders, the operators. So they need to come back to, to come together to operationalize it. Now, the way it would work is that instead of routing payments through third parties, instead of only using third party currencies, we would, be, we would be actually able to route payments through our own banks within Africa. And then we would be able to use our own currencies. You go to your bank to instruct a payment to be made using your own currencies. And the payee, the person you are paying to, would also receive payment in a currency of their choice, whether it's the local currency of the country they live in or one of the uh, international currencies there, like the dollar. Now, I have to add that this is not just a uh, dreaming, because in the common market for Eastern and Southern Africa, where I come from, we have got the Comesa Regional Payment Settlement System. Uh, we call it REPS. Now, this system is very efficient, is in operation, and it is working already. Ambassador Kwesi, when you look at the kind of um, environment that uh, the uh, CFTA is being launched today, of course, we, we are looking at uh, many other countries um, in the West particularly turning inward. What is your assessment though, of the global trade environment in which the CFTA is being launched today? And, and do you see the CFTA as Africa's answer to an unfair global trading system? In a way, yes, but you see, if you lay yourself open, people will treat you unfairly. But if you trade within yourselves, among ourselves as Africans, and we don't come cap in hand, people will negotiate with us at arm's length and treat us with respect. And this is what the CFTA is beginning to show. I, I, I recall I had a meeting with uh, the U.S. Trade Representative Ambassador Lighthizer. And he started to talk about the CFT being uh, in contravention of WTO rules. I, I explained to him that when all the African countries sign it, it, is, it will be akin to what they did in Philadelphia in 1787. Then he sat up and said, well, then we, we, we shall come and invest and construct because President Trump is a builder. We will come to help to build the infrastructure. They already began to see the, 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 the potential and they are ready to jump in. Now, our colleagues in the European Union, I mean, the closest of Africa to Europe itself is something of strategic advantage. They are beginning to worry about Chinese investment. So all this increased competition among investors will begin to see Africa now as not just the, the dark continent, but as the continent, the manufacturing base for the future. And with the population, that we see growing in Africa, it will also be a potential market, a potential creator of capital. What we need to do now is to prepare our youth in science, technology, and literature. And we we'll begin to see now the flowering of African culture that people like Nelson Mandela, people like Kwame Nkrumah, people like um, uh, Mrs. Winnie Mandela dreamt about. So we're seeing something very new happening now. And as it progresses, 
it develops a force and a momentum of its own. So the United Africa, which you dreamed up in Vision 2063, is slowly developing on the horizon. Right, uh, Dr. Mangiti, let me get you. already left the station. Let me get your thoughts here because Africa's share of global trade is only about three percent. Is this an opportunity now for uh, Africa through the CFTA to grow its share of global trade? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And uh, the continental free trade area is actually timely. Because as you were just asking uh, uh, His Excellency Ambassador Kwesi, yes, the global environment is not that good. Uh, we have had revisions downwards of economic growth prospects uh, by the IMF and other international bodies uh, because of the tensions, the trade tensions, whether that's between China and the US or you know, Brexit in the, in the UK. Uh, yeah, things like that. So the global environment is really not looking good. So the continental free trade area sends a signal that it is still possible to be open, to be open markets and to promote trade, to support a, an open uh, global economy. But now what it also does is to tell us Africa, in light of what's happening elsewhere in the world, that we need to pull together. We need to look at ourselves. We have got huge potential within Africa, which we need to tap into. For instance, if I can just give you a statistic, uh, if you allow me. We've done some analysis in Comesa to see how much trade could happen, which is not happening, trade potential. Right. And for trading goods alone, excluding services, the figure is $82.3 billion annually. This is trade which is not happening just because people are not aware of the opportunities. They, don't, they aren't aware that products are available next door, which can be imported, instead of importing them from China, instead of importing them maybe from the U.S. So it's an opportunity for us now to look inside and draw on our strengths. We do what everybody else is saying. You see how everybody else is coming to Africa from all over the world uh, to, to, to try to seek to pursue opportunities here. So we need to pursue these opportunities uh, ourselves, of course, jointly with whoever wants to work with us, whoever has goodwill uh, towards us. So it is a tremendous opportunity and the timing is right. Dr. Mangiti and Ambassador Kwesi to stay with us. We'll continue this discussion in a moment. We are going to take a short break. When we return, we'll explore more on the continental free trade area. Stay tuned. China Global Television Network. From broadcast centers in Beijing, Washington, and Nairobi. A unique global perspective. Six channels and a video content service. News when you want it and where you want it. On TV screens, websites, mobile platforms and social media. CGTN. See the difference. Welcome back to Talk Africa. Let's continue our discussion on the continental free trade area. Still with me in studio, Dr. Francis Mangeni, uh, Ambassador Kwate Thomas Kwesi from Addis Ababa, the Deputy Chairperson of the African Union Commission. And also joining me now from uh, Lagos by Muda Yusuf. He's the Director General at the Lagos Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Uh, Muda Yusuf, thank you for joining us on the program. Uh, let me go straight to the issue of Nigeria because Nigeria became the latest entrant to uh, join the uh, CFTA. First of all, what were Nigeria's concerns and have those concerns from Nigeria been, been addressed? Well, the major concern was the inadequate consultation that preceded the earlier decision or the earlier signing of the uh, agreement. Uh, the stakeholders in the economy, particularly the manufacturers in the Nigerian economy, were concerned about the challenges of competitiveness. Uh, Nigeria has a major issue with infrastructure and uh, this has been affecting the operating costs, the production costs, and it has also been affecting the competitiveness of goods that are produced in Nigeria. So the manufacturers in Nigeria felt that they needed to be assured that exposure to the competitive pressure of the continental free trade area will not put their businesses and investments at risk. 
So it was this consultation that the government needed to do, not just consultation, but also assurance from the government that this agreement will not put their businesses at risk. So it was that, that was what took some time. And after assurance has been given and they found some comfort, that was uh, when the uh, our president now decided to sign the agreement. Right. Uh, Ambassador Kwesi, uh, what do you see as some of the priorities now, though, that, that member states have to uh, engage or focus on in the short term, in the medium term, and in the long term? In the short term, we have to focus on harmonizing the rules and uh, ensuring that uh, no national economy feels uh, hard done by. In the, in, the, in the short to, in the medium to long term, we have to begin to focus on training, education of our young people. We need to begin to think boldly of a literate and a numerate Africa where every child is in school, where there's a peaceful environment for them to grow and develop and plan for employment as they finish school. So that is a, a longer term vision, but it also demands that we start work on that now. And uh, beginning as uh, one Nigerian entrepreneur tries to do, to develop entrepreneurs among our youth so that we stop looking for employment only with government. And I, I have, I have uh, unbounded belief in the capacity of the African youth to dream dreams and to make these dreams a reality. Dr. Mangeni, of course, uh, the Thank CFTA you. has borrowed broadly from uh, the regional economic community. So in terms of focus for member states, what do you think should be their immediate focus? Yes, so I think in the, in the short term, in the medium term, member states, based on the experience in the RECs, need to make sure that they have all the tools that are required for trade to be, begin happening under the CFTA, trade documentation. Secondly, they need to start preparing national strategies for utilizing the CFTA, just like we have heard from Nigeria. So you need to position yourself to, take, to make the most of the continent of free trade area. So you need strategies. Then thirdly, there are a number of institutions which are supposed to be established under the CFTA. Without the institutions, the CFTA will not function. So you need the secretariat to be there. You need the committees dealing with the standards, with the rules of origin and things like that to be in place. So the institutional framework needs to be put in place. And as I had hinted earlier, we have this outstanding work which needs to be finished, such as operationalization of the digital payment and settlement system, putting in place a system for addressing rules of origin, completing negotiations on uh, tariffs, that's not yet completed, completing negotiations on rules of origin, we are almost there, but it's not yet done. So this outstanding work also needs to be done. So this is for the immediate term. But now the immediate to, or the short term to the medium term, we need to make sure we put in place systems that can help implementation. There's a, this allegation that Africa is very good at concluding agreements, but then the next day they forget about them. Uh, they are never implemented. So we need to make sure we put in place a sustainable way of ensuring that we implement our agreements. This includes making sure that the political activism, the political leadership, which has uh, helped us to achieve the CFTA in a record time, of just about one and a half years of, of signature, having it ratified. That needs to be maintained in terms of the political leaders keeping, this, keeping their eyes on the ball, right. not, for, not, not, not taking their eyes off the ball. Otherwise, we will forget about it and jump onto other priorities. And yet, this is a very important priority, which is going to lead us into the future. And then, uh, secondly, in the medium to long term, as uh, Ambassador Kwesi was saying, I think we need to put in place sustainable capacity building programs including structured courses and education in our universities, in our high right. education schools, and even in our primary schools, as well as government officials, as well as people in the private sector about the content of free trade area. If people are, are not aware about the content of free trade area, 
they will not use it. And by the way, this is a continuous process. You always have new entrants in the private sector and in government. Let's hear from the private sector because Mr. Muda uh, Yusuf, I'm sure the business community is uh, uh, looking forward to trading in this new environment. What do you think should be the focus though in the medium, uh, in the short term, medium term and the long term? Well, I think what, is, what should be the focus are the, those things that can facilitate trade. Right now, on the continent, there's a major issue with connectivity. I'm talking about physical connectivity, either by road, by rail, or by sea. Uh, it is very, very expensive, very costly in terms of transportation, moving from one part of the continent to the other. So for the economics of trade and economics of investment across the continent, to be right, we need to place a lot of emphasis on road infrastructure, the railway infrastructure, and the waterways connection. So connectivity is very, very critical and strategic for trade facilitation. Secondly, we need to get the commitment of member states to remove all non-tariff barriers. Because our experience in ECOWAS has been that it is one thing for the political leadership to sign the treaty. It's another thing for the institutions of each country to demonstrate practical commitment to the implementation of the treaty. So the removal of non-tariff barriers is very, very important to ensure that uh, these things happen. Then we also need to also recognize that trade is not just about goods, physical goods. It's also about services. Nigeria, for instance, is about 50% services. Our GDP is made up of 50% services sector. So there are quite a lot of opportunities in that area, and I'm sure that all the barriers around that should also be removed so that there could be free flow of labor, capital, and personnel that can deliver services across the continent. Then the rule of origin, I've emphasized it, it is very, very important so that all the member states can have faith in the, in the agreement. Because if there is no commitment to enforcement of the rule of origin, then it could put the entire agreement at risk. All right, Ambassador Kwesi, we are going to give you the final word on this as we wind up the program because the African Union chairperson, uh, Mr. Musa Faki Mahamad, described the free trade agreement as one of the instruments for continental integration in line with the objectives of the Abuja Treaty and the aspirations of the Agenda 2063. How is the F CFTA, though, going to help with achieving Agenda 2063? Your final comment. The CFTA is a major step towards achieving Agenda 2063. But before you, you let us go, I think a word, a word of thanks and gratitude is in order for President Isifu of Niger for all the work that he has done. He was a champion of this whole process. And it was just right that this matter should have ended up in Niamey, where he's president. So congratulations to President Isifu, congratulations to President Kagame, where the agreement was signed in Kigali, and to President uh, of the African Union, my, my boss, Faki Mahamat, for all the work he's done. This has been a rare privilege to see Africa moving in the right direction. We are going to leave it there for the moment. Uh, that's all we have time for on this edition of Talk Africa. Big thank you to our panel of experts, Ambassador Kwati Thomas Kwesi from Addis Ababa, the Deputy Chairperson of the African Union Commission. In Lagos, Muda Yusuf, the Director General at the Lagos Chamber of Commerce and Industry, and Dr. Francis Mangeni, the Director of Trade and Customs Division at the Common Market for Eastern and Southern Africa.